Welcome to the Audacious Freedom Podcast, episode 10, calling on my angels, my audacious family for love, support, and freedom. I'm your host, Didi Mendez. I am a storyteller, a perpetual student of self-development, and an audacious life liver, among many other areas of expertise and interests. I am most recently the founder of audaciousfreedom.com. I come to you, my listeners, with stories about what I learn, read, observe, and experience in the world today. I am inspired by so many other storytellers, and I am told I inspire others as well with my own stories. This episode came to me because I have been connected to my angels, the universe, love, and a few of my relatives who have passed on. And I have discovered that they are among my angels who I turn to when I meditate to ask my angels, the universe and love to call in my imagination, to tell me the story I was born to tell with my life, to tell me the next audacious freedom, the podcast episode to write and record for you, my listeners. Among my angels are my abuela, my nanny, Daddy, Grandpapa, and Tio Rico. Let me tell you all about them, and you'll see what we all have in common. Abuela, my mom's mom, took a huge chance on my grandfather, moving from, it's not entirely clear to me, Brazil or Argentina, to Queens, New York, to Torbeo, a little town in Galicia, Spain, I'll tell you about. What did she leave behind? Did she have a better life going to Torbeo with my grandfather? Nanny, my dad's mom, could probably have married anyone she wanted. Many, she had many different suitors. And I think she was affluent or affluent-ish having grown up in Bayonne, New Jersey. She was a petite sky blue-eyed brunette I think naturally brunette and then redhead most of her life. And I believe she, she did have many suitors, perhaps even at least one actor and a Naval Academy officer. She chose my grandfather, a West Point graduate and a Mexican man to marry. At least that's how his race was listed on his retirement papers from the army. His father was Mexican and his mother Native American. I grew up thinking that she, his mother, was Shoshone. Then I heard as an adult that she was Seminole. Now, when I look at my grandfather's wiki page, it says he was a Mexican-American, Spanish, and Navajo Indian. Clearly, there's more research that I have to do here. Anyway, Nanny was bold and audacious and had an interracial marriage with my grandfather. This is 1940. They raised 12 children, most recently in Lake Barcroft in Falls Church, Virginia, six miles from the Pentagon, just outside of Washington, DC. Some of my aunts and uncles remember being called wetbacks, I'm doing air quotes here, by some neighborhood kids and classmates because our last name, Mendez, is Mendez. Nanny died in 2012, and I never asked her about what the interracial marriage was like for her, what discrimination she experienced for herself and for her children, from her audacity to marry a brown man, a man of color, a half Mexican man, a half indigenous person. By the way, indigenous people means the original inhabitants of a given land or region. Indigenous peoples of America has the same general meaning as Native Native Americans. I read recently that Native American has been widely used in the US, but it is is falling out of favor with some groups. And the terms American Indian or Indigenous American are preferred by many Native people. The thing is, I can't ask anyone because I don't know my Native people. As progressive and bold and audacious as Nanny was, 
she did not embrace my grandfather's family. I never spoke with her about this either or with my grandfather who died in 2001 on September 19th, eight days after 9-11, the day he was sent home for hospice care. Much later in the day than originally planned because all of the local ambulances were sent to the Pentagon after the terrorist attacks on America that morning in New York City, DC and Pennsylvania. My dad's youngest sister, my grandparents' youngest daughter, Lori, was visiting from LA and she remembers feeling the boom of the plane hitting the Pentagon, again, just six miles away and where my grandfather had worked after active service in the army. I was living in Manhattan walking to work at the time and didn't hear or see a thing from Midtown about four miles away from downtown New York City when the Twin Towers were hit that sickening day. Sorry, I'm distracted by the date and there are so many other stories to tell about 9-11. For now, back to my family. I never spoke with either of my grandparents about their 1940 interracial marriage, the effects of it on themselves or their children. And I never spoke with them about my grandfather's mom and dad. I do know that his mom was named Julia and his dad was Luis Gonzaga Mendez. My grandfather was Luis Gonzaga Mendez Jr. And my father, the firstborn son to my grandfather is Luis Gonzaga Mendez III. And that's pretty much all I know. They raised my grandfather and his brother, Albert, two sisters, Helen and Carmen in Trinidad, California, sorry, Trinidad, Colorado. I never met my great grandparents. I imagine they died before I was born. And I did at least a couple of times meet Albert and his family. I think it was somewhere in Texas uh, or maybe, no, no, New Mexico and Helen and Carmen. There was an amazing family resemblance between my grandfather and his brother and sisters. I've always thought of their physical characteristics as more Native American, or should I say American Indian or Indigenous American, with high cheekbones, sharp noses, high rib cages, and long lean legs. I'm proud to say that I have those cheekbones, rib cage, and long legs. I am one eighth. Native American and one eighth Mexican from my grandfather. I am a quarter combination of Irish, Welsh, French, German, and maybe some other things from my grandmother. And I am a quarter Spanish from Spain from Abuelo, my mom's father, and a quarter Brazilian or maybe it's Argentinian where she was born um, from Abuela. My mom's mom, my abuela, who I never knew. I did meet abuela once or twice when I was young, when my mom took my sister and me to visit. My dad needed to stay behind the first time we went, I think, for work. And I think he went the second time. I remember my grandfather looking very weathered from sun and hard work and cigars, I think. Uh, from tending to the animals and the land at their little farm in the mountains of Galicia and a very small pueblo called Torreo. All my grandparents seem very courageous to me. Abuela might have been born in Argentina and Tina and raised in Brazil, then traveled to New York City and Queens where she met my abuelo, who seemed to be living a wealthy man's life before he persuaded Abuela to marry him and move back to Torreo with him. Some of my cousins, cousins in Spain say our abuela got dealt a raw deal that our abuelo sort of tricked her. I don't know. Like I said before, what might she have been getting away from in Brazil? And I've already talked about Nanny's audacity to marry a brown man. By the way, my grandfather, who we always lovingly called Daddy Grandpapa or Daddy G or DG, was also bold in marrying Nanny. She had strong opinions and was an early supporter of gay marriage, that gay men and women should have children and that women should be able to come, become priests. This coming from the mother of 12 children and a dedicated Catholic. Some say that Nanny's personality and opinions 
maybe or maybe not on those specific issues I just mentioned could have impacted daddy grandpapa's military career, but maybe he made it as far as only colonel because of Manny. And I wonder how much more we could have known about Daddy G's family and heritage if Nanny would have embraced them. The thing I do know is that Daddy G adored Nanny and worshiped her beauty and she was a beauty and her having given him 12 children. If he had any regrets about his career or his closeness to his family, he didn't show it and he sure didn't blame Nanny to, to my knowledge. So I can see some of what I have in common with my abuela, abuelo, nanny, and daddy, grandpapa. It's sort of a, I don't give a shit about what other people think, and I'm willing to live a life of freedom that may be less mainstream than anyone else's. These are definitely my people, and I wish I could have conversations with them now. I have so many questions for them. The next best thing for me to do is to talk with my parents, their siblings, and my cousins to find out what they heard growing up, what they remember and know about their parents, our grandparents, and I will be reaching out to them all before it's too late. Sadly, it's too late to talk with Rico. It will be 10 years, or actually from the time of writing this, it would have been 10 years uh, in a couple of days, and I'm recording this on July 9th, so it was yesterday, July 8th since his husband, my Tia Lance, found him unresponsive on the floor of their San Francisco apartment. Rico was 56 years old, and it was a god-awful phone call to receive with that news. I was 45, not that much younger than Rico, and we had been really kind of peers in many ways since my young adulthood. Rico and like, I liked the same thing with cocktails, cooking, throwing dinner parties, and dancing until the wee hours of the morning, especially the cha-cha and the pata-pata. I made several trips to San Francisco to stay with Rico and Lance over the decades, and can even remember one party where the last three people standing were Nanny, Rico, and me at 3 a.m. Lance, by the way, that night had long gone to bed well, bed, I use that term loosely, it was the floor, and maybe he was on or inside of a sleeping bag with my baby girl pug, Cookie, snuggled up next to him. Somewhere I know I, I have an old school photograph, you know, printed photograph of Lance smiling while sleeping with Cookie in his arms. I got to find that picture. For work, Rico was an artist and for many years was the art director for the San Francisco Chronicle. He moved to San Francisco when he was 17, I, I think was the story is since he was 17, after I think having dropped out of high school and I think having run away from home. My absolute favorite memories growing up in, in general as a Mendez grandchild were the holiday celebrations in Lake Barcroft at Nanny and Daddy Grandpapa's house on Stony Bray Drive. The youngest of the Mendez kids were the most fun and paid the most attention to us us grandkids. They were also the most creative, especially when it came to us grandkids putting on skits for the family. Rico and the youngest, Lori, who is just about six year old, is just six years older than I am, would dress us in costumes and teach us our minds for the skits. I think we did the same four or five skits year after year. And I remember the howls of laughter from my aunts and uncles and their significant others every single time, as if they were watching the skits for the first time. All the adults were crowded around the bar, sipping cocktails, and the ashtrays were full of lit cigarettes and crushed out butts. My aunts were pretty makeup and styled hair and clothes, like all the women in the magazines. And I wanted to be just like them. I wanted to be a grown-up and to throw parties and to not have a care in the world. I loved telling my friends about the Mendez mayhem at our family parties, about the silly things my uncles especially would do. Rico could make perfect chimpanzee faces and sounds. I mean, the loud shrieking and even the hand and arm movements in the chimpanzee walk, too. He'd even pretend to eat bugs out of our hair. <laughs> 
I remember that none of my friends or classmates had the kind of parties the Mendezes did, and many loved to hear our stories. I guess that was the beginning of my storytelling days, talking about my family's antics and how many of us might be packed into that house on Stony Bray, literally wall to wall, cousins, aunts, and uncles, easily as many as 40 or 50 of us, especially once the after party started and the second cousins began to show up and maybe even some high school friends of the 12 Mendez kids. So Rico, Nanny and Daddy G have been gone respectively now 10 years, nine years and almost 20 years. And I know that they are among my angels and the universe and love and they support and love me and understand my need for freedom and my audacity because in many ways, they lived freely and audaciously too. I also know that Abuela is with me, even though I never met her. She died when my mom was 16, which was about six years before I was born. I know she and my other family, I was close with it. I know she and my other family I was close with are with me because of the energetic work I do. I check in, I know they are there. They were all audacious in their day and they love and support my audacity and my telling stories about us all. One more important person is with me now and he's very much alive and free and audacious as a role model for us all. And he is my Tia Lance, Rico's husband who survived him in these past 10 years. In fact, Tia Lance and I have been texting all week about the 10 year anniversary of Rico's death. Well, we've been texting all week, but not only about the anniversary of Rico's death because that's not where Tia Lance and I go. We catch up on each other's lives, his love life and what's going on with me and my daughter and a little family gossip, but only the sweetest in the sweetest of ways, like who fell down dancing and who told her daughter's boyfriend after she was a little tipsy that she liked him and wanted him to become her son, son-in-law. I have never seen anyone handle life so well as Lance. He's always got a smile on his face and seems to look at the world playfully and is way more than half full. He voluntarily inserted himself into the Mendez family circus for 29 years. And even after Rico's death, Tia Lance still comes to the funerals and goes to the weddings and has been part of our family for 39 years now. Maybe it's because Tia Lance likes the circus, a circus he can always unclaim if things get too out of hand or dramatic. Tia Lance is also one of those people who naturally rolls with things and who doesn't seem to have any an anxious bone in his body. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. And he knows how to live life and to make the most out of a shitty situation. A few years after Rico died, Tia Lance sold their place and made a small fortune. He decided to use part of that money to travel around the US and Europe, staying with friends in B&Bs for two years. How fucking cool is that? Two years a two-year vacation in his early 50s. He's since gone back to San Francisco and to work, and he lives very differently than he did before in the way that most of us live now, with lots of stuff and lots of rooms in our homes. Tia Lance is happy now with a studio, with a rooftop and a garden, and he still travels it every chance he gets, and I love him for his joy and freedom. I'm glad I could share some of my family heritage with you. It's fun to see that I inherited personality traits from my ancestors, even if I didn't know them well or at all. I guess that's nature for you. I have audacity and freedom built into my core, thanks to Abuela, Nanny, Daddy, Grandpapa, Rico, and Tia Lance, who might not be an actual blood relative, though he is family and we are joyful and alike in many ways. I need to reach out to other living family to get as much family history, at least stories, as I can while they are still around. 
Stay tuned for a Mendez family update in the future. This is Benditi Mendez with Audacious Freedom, the podcast. Thank you for listening, and I can't wait for next time.